What up? Hey. Welcome to day two of uh, Seattle Jazz Comp. Hope everybody had a good night. I did. Um, it means today's emceeing is sponsored by Jameson and Coors Light. Yeah. Huh? No, that's not a joke. <laughs> that's not a joke at all. Ask Carlos. Um, yeah, so for our opening keynote today, we have two speakers here to tell us all about founding, running, and maintaining conferences. And maybe they could give me some tips on emceeing. Uh, everybody, please welcome to the stage Tracy Hines and Catherine Lopez. Awesome. Hi. So uh, before we get started, um, we're going to be speaking on communities, conferences, and donuts. Do you really want to know how they're made? So uh, as part of that, uh, we've got something to share with you this morning, uh, which the awesome organizers of this conference will help pass out right now. So a little tradition we have in the borough JS communities uh, where I live currently in New York City is that we'll have treats after some of the meetups. Uh, but it turns out New York's really expensive. And uh, so what we'll do is we'll share with a friend. So uh, we've got donuts for everyone from Top Pot. And we're just asking that everyone uh, cut them in half and make a new friend uh, so that we've got enough for everyone. Uh, so uh, we'll get started. Right, yeah. So. How do you grow communities? So much of our experiences have been through powerful, meaningful, repeated interactions online and in person. Communities need a way to voice themselves. It can be intentional or accidental. This can be on stage presenting our opinions of cultural norms and code commonalities. This can be in the values we move forward in project governance or how we engage. So much of our learnings have been through the trials and tribulations of A-B testing experiences within Cascadia, Empire JS, Node, JSConf Colombia, ScaleConf Colombia, and code projects. Founding them, running them, maintaining them. What does it mean to maintain a conference? What does it mean to the organizers and also the community it benefited to retire one? So at some point, we realized that there was something unique about the way that we approach conferences. And it can prove pretty difficult to copy and paste. Uh, much like the JavaScript frameworks that many of us use now and love, our work is built off of the prior lessons of the giants before us. The thought and genuine care that we like to apply to communities, along with understanding the nuances of converting this into implementation of conferences with real world budgets, and consequences uh, led us to create the nonprofit that we run now, GatherScript, with Charlie Robbins. And much of these lessons have been codified over the years into our open source organizer handbook. So we have no interest in running every conference. There are many incredible, humble people running conferences. Different geographies and cultures allowed for experimentation, risks, failures, and successes. We want folks to feel the responsibility of what they're doing, avoid the pitfalls, and help contribute to a legacy of heartfelt experiences that can truly be life-changing. So feeling the responsibility of what we're doing, the why of what we do with community co and conferences. Let's walk it back to the premise. So why? Why do an in-person tech event? And like, why does that matter in the age of online uh, and distributed collaboration? And I think the answer that you've experienced yesterday uh, is that it's experience and connection. Decisions get made, inspiration is discovered, uh, new connections are forged. These experiences build careers, confidence, unique opportunities, and whole communities. And they help codify the really powerful reasons of why folks get into programming and stay in it. Ever tried to pull request a code project you consume and end up having to walk away from that work because the maintainers aren't fluent in how to manage open source contributions, i.e., maybe they're a jerk? Uh, so we run conferences because we want to be the change we want to see in the world. We're community builders. 
even if that's to some degree helping with technology changes, cultural changes. Some folks do this because they see gaps in what's being covered in content. Others start them because they feel uh, a sense of community is lacking in the circles that they participate in. We all just want to learn and maybe enjoy our work too. So why did we start? I personally sort of fell into it. Juan Pablo Ritica, a friend in New York, asked me to help out with the first JSConf Colombia, as we had previously worked on CodeRise together. CodeRise is an in-person event series teaching kids to code through identifying a real life problem and exploring a tech solution for it, concluding with a demo. We were talking about how we wanted to help teach kids to code, so why not? Let's do it. Set up a campaign for Code Rise. Juan Pablo, Camilo, Julian, and a few others. You know, we set up the curriculum. We did the financial log logistics, an Indiegogo campaign, and the applications and marketing, and it has taken off since then. We then jumped into JSConf Colombia with one with only one of the organizers having prior conference experience. The money stress with sales and sponsorship was a huge challenge. Even with fellow organizers being experienced meetup organizers, we will talk more about this later on. Through JSConf Colombia, I met Charlie Robbins, who was already running EmpireJS and asked me to join his organizing team. And we have been working together on EmpireJS and Empire Node since 2013, where I met Tracy. Then came ScaleConf Colombia, a language agnostic event focused on distributed systems inspired by the growing communities in Colombia, an increased interest in DevOps, distributed systems, and the best, and most importantly, a super motivated core organizing team that I felt confident enough in trying a new event with, despite all the challenges of starting a new events, which we will touch on later on again. I personally love to mesh education and tech, let it be through the conferences, teaching kids, or supporting foundations, like the Marina Orth Foundation that works with low-income schools in Medellin to learn English and other core curriculums using computers and has an incredibly strong robotics program. Uh, as you can see in the picture, the children are programming Arduinos using Scratch on one laptop per child. Uh, and I am a career transitioner. So my first engineering gig was in Portland, Oregon, but it wasn't that long ago. Uh, there was a new meetup starting every week. Uh, people were chomping at the bit for the latest and greatest technologies, uh, and so that was part of the meetup scene. Uh, and I was happy to, to share in that. So I found a group uh, that was started that had, I had been really interested in. Uh, and I offered support. Uh, and so I emailed and I messaged uh, the group people I knew who were forming the group. Um, I had been attending some of the meetups and, and wanted to help out from uh, just sort of like foundational perspective of um, things that were lacking. Uh, and I got no response. I messaged on Meetup, I asked at the events, I got no response. And um, after sharing how excited I was to help out, uh, my mentor, uh, had suggested I try some other ways, but was also kind of surprised that um, I was having so much trouble uh, offering help. Um, but so I just I just started attending more uh, because like who turns down help? <laughs> um, uh, but they did, and so I attended all their meetups anyway, and I helped out peripherally whenever I could. And it took me uh, insisting that they needed a familiar face at the very informal hack time, which I ended up turning into a formal hack time. Um, every Saturday in a cafe, so uh, I was pretty much there every weekend as a support system for the other people learning to code, uh, except for I was, when I was away at a conference. Um, and then I attended the first PDX Node event, and uh, Ben Acker had announced the event to be hosted at Walmart Labs, and at the time, it was, Node was really new in the Portland community, and uh, I had just started writing JavaScript full-time at my job after having um, learned Python uh, to get the job. Uh, so uh, the energy was incredible at the event, and the attendees were so inviting and friendly, and uh, of course, as I do, uh, but I didn't know this at the time, that this was a habit, uh, I followed up with the organizers about how many great things I had to look forward to, and um, Ben Acker immediately was like, you should just help us organize. First time he'd ever met me. If you know Ben, you'll know that this is just his thing. Um, so I was just like, okay, yes and ran with it. 
Uh, and I helped make sure there were speakers. I attended and announced the meetups. I helped get sponsorships. I worked up the courage to give my first talk at the Node PDX conference. I went on to run JavaScript conferences as a hobby while working full time as an engineer because it felt like I had a purpose while I was a lousy junior engineer. Um, I shared with attendees the fun times we were having and how awesome a node was in the space. And it was all because Ben had asked. And pretty much nothing is more welcoming to a new programmer, regardless of your age, uh, than being asked to help in some capacity and being able to do that. So um, I felt the power of that in community. And we went on to run International Nodebots Day, where I met Carter Rabasa. He ended up asking me to run Cascadia after I had self-organized a really fun hacker train. Uh, and then I went on to help run EmpireJS and found Empire Node when I relocated to New York City, uh, where Catherine and I got to hone our work together. <laughs> Thus, our fall down the uh, event organizing rabbit hole. <sighs> so Cascadia, JSConf Colombia, EmpireJS, Empire Node, and ScaleConf Colombia, and other meetups. These events are all run by incredibly large-hearted people who care about the big picture. Small teaching moments of the value in doing the right thing, educating people, and raising them up to be in warriors of niceness while improving their professional skills. But the conference themselves have the same challenges that so many people do in open source. So many organizers have been struggling to build and keep to good practices, maintain teams, avoid burnout, and stay in the black. So again, lots of open source and allergies here. Uh, we run conferences. We have organizer friends who also do, and they're asking for support and guidance. Uh, a way to give events a chance at a healthier future and building support networks. So we found a gather script. Uh, this is our mission statement. We empower communities that prioritize inclusivity, transparency, and people over business through mentorship and finances for technology gatherings around the world. Uh, and we'll explain to you more what that means from a practical standpoint. Uh, but what we're going to talk about next is the lost sleep, uh, gray hairs, uh, and also the drive behind the founding of GatherScript. We'll share our hard-earned lessons so you can keep your beauty sleep in here. So avoiding the pitfalls how to run events, and the trouble with maintaining them. Figuring out whether they live on, figuring out a way to do that. What does it mean to maintain a conference? What does it mean to the organizers? Also, the community it benefited to retire one. And then there's lack of experience. How do you start a conference when you have no idea? <laughs> Trying to run a community event? Many have the energy and heart. Almost none have event experience. We're going to walk through the strengths of roles, values, bandwidth, and perspectives of conference organizing. Uh, so we're going to do a reality check here. Uh, you've just started a company. Uh, who does that? So who says over drinks, let's do this little thing that costs lots of money, will take up endless hours of our lives, cause us heartburn and lost sleep. Oh, and it likely pays you nothing. Uh, that sounds like fun, right? Um, so you need an entity to sign contracts, uh, to get insurance, to pay taxes, establish bank accounts, and sell tickets and get sponsors to provide you money. Um, and then there's the matter of whether you want to operate as a nonprofit, because a lot of sponsors uh, really appreciate that. Uh, a lesser known fact of most community conferences in and outside of the JavaScript community is that they aren't nonprofits. This isn't a bad thing, it's just something to be aware of. Uh, most are bolstered by consulting companies, uh, and at the very least, that allows them to use some of their marketing budget and resources so that they have flexibility on, uh, if someone was running independently, financial losses, uh, which are common. And this brings us to money. Money. So I was completely lost and blind when organizing my first event in 2013, which was JSCOM Colombia. I had overall logistic experience, which was helpful, but I was not familiar with the tech conference world. However, the hardest and most stressful part was making sure we had enough money. Sponsorships and sales are hard for events, even more for a new event. 
JSConf Columbia didn't have the audience or the community following to easily sell tickets. Canon sponsorship was even worse as a new event. And to make it even harder, US companies weren't and aren't interested geographically in non-US or non-European markets. While the Colombian companies at, the, at this point in 2013 did not see the benefit to sponsoring. This eliminated a very expected revenue stream for the conference budget. Due to our first year's su success and influence in the growth of the community throughout the years, the Colombian companies have learned to appreciate this value and approaching sponsorship has ease and challenge, not only for the conferences, but also for local meetups. This sheds light on one of the big organizing challenges a first year conference often means you establish presidents or get to be the guinea pig of these pain points. <laughs> Speaking of sponsors, let's remind ourselves that this is a business. Customer service is a thing regardless of whether you are getting paid to provide it. Sponsors, speakers, and attendees have all invested their time or money to be at our conference. So make sure you show some love to those who sponsored this event. And be mindful of the pain points we've shared to you as attendees because it's hard out there for an organizer such as all the practical stuff. So logistics, what to spend money on when you're on a tight budget, which is pretty much every community conference. Uh, when to compromise and spend a little more. Things like AV are really big here. Video, do you do streaming? Uh, child care or transcription. A lot of these things are going to help your conference live on as a legacy online. Others are gonna make the conference experience uh, more comfortable or basically accessible. Uh, so, uh, and, but they cost a lot of money. Uh, then there's venue. Uh, so the venue, the space that you end up getting to enjoy in a conference setting, has to go through contract negotiations and getting your preferred dates. It turns out, depending on the region that you live in, this can be a huge challenge and you have to book up to a year out. Uh, and unfortunately, most of our community conferences are not operating on a year timeline. Uh, so parties. Uh, what space are you going to have the parties in? How close are they going to be to the conference? Is everyone enjoying themselves? Did you provide some form of entertainment other than alcohol? Uh, all of these things are, are, are a huge challenge and also cost money. Uh, swag, making sure that it doesn't all end up in a donation bin and that you're not being wasteful about it. Coordinating it from the sponsors so they don't provide duplicate items. Uh, sizing, anything that you create that's a size is going to have waste and make someone unhappy. Uh, and then making sure that you provide sizes that fit everyone, uh, which is very difficult. Uh, timeline, again, uh, we're all humans. We tend to be doing other things than uh, running a conference for free. So um, operating on a timeline that doesn't break your organizers is also really helpful and also to make sure that your speakers have time to book travel and to attend as well as your attendees. Uh, call for talks management. You have the speaker declines uh, and also the speaker experience. So, uh, you know, anyone who's potentially applying for a talk at a conference is also a potential attendee. They are a part of the community. You want to make sure that they have a good experience even if they don't get accepted. And that's something that gets botched a lot. And then even then, once the speaker signed on, the experience from the time that you've locked them in to the time that they walk off stage, you want to make sure that they enjoy it because they can be an evangelist for the experience. Uh, marketing. Most of us don't know how to do it other than tweet, and oftentimes we mess that up too. Uh, so having people who know how to do this is so incredibly valuable because it also helps make sure people know when your conference is happening, when tickets are on sale, when the CFP is happening, when the party's going down. Uh, and website. So many of us are web developers, but it turns out you can have a full team of developers and have a really a subpar conference website. Uh, so it helps to have someone who's maybe a little detached from that uh, doing that work for you to make sure that you're getting the updates you need. Also things like people gotta eat and sleep. So when they're attending conferences, you wanna find somewhere that's not too far away, people can stay if they're not from in town. And dietary restrictions are a thing. You don't wanna put somebody in the hospital. And speaking of event insurance, Always get it. <laughs> and then we have people being human. We have competing personalities, egos, 
regions with different cultural behaviors for being welcoming. Yeah. Organizers can disagree. Sponsors have expectations. Attendees aren't all besties. Even speakers sharing their expertise can have massive philosophical differences. We get to juggle all of this while being pretty imperfect ourselves behind the scenes. Yeah. Without a doubt, there's always something unexpected happening. Being open to learning and laughing about all of it have, helps. Really, we do need to laugh sometimes just to make it easier. Yeah. So uh, another huge challenge of conference and event running, or community building even, is learning how to execute on a code of conduct. So, legal fun times, friendship treading, physically dangerous conduct, all of thing, these things will happen at events. Having a code of conduct is vital. It should be as common as guidelines in the workplace for behavior. We're combining work and social environments, and this is likely very combustible, so establishing expectations is important. Uh, we train our organizing team with a reporting and execution guidelines so they don't have to make moral or legal decisions on their own. It's always multiple organizers. So these organizers are also vetted from the beginning of planning to ensure that they feel confident and willing to enforce the rules. This is probably one of the least fun things you will ever get to do as a conference organizer. Yeah. We do not enjoy it despite how much people talk about codes of conduct. So over the years, these are some of the best practices we found. Organizers, group numbers, that goes to the whole team and emails. And if email is an alias, you need to list out who that alias actually goes for, goes to for safety's sake. A reporting app. Watch out for no signal if you use SMS. <laughs> a code of conduct agreement that gates a purchase for registration to attend. Execution guidelines. Recommend that a lawyer review these. We are not lawyers. Nope. Nope. Definitely not. Open Twitter DMs. Identifiable clothing and badges for organizers. Identifies them throughout the conference as safety crew to talk to. All volunteers should be educated in who they should walk someone to. Most likely an organizer in order to escalate a report. Volunteers should be instructed to not handle this on their own and to not dismiss it ever. Even keep an eye out for behavior that isn't being reported have an, an incredibly diverse organizing crew because people will report to who they feel safest around. And review the code of conduct and reporting guidelines before the conference with all organizers and volunteers together. So, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Uh, there's always going to be something unexpected. People get angry, organizers mess up, big, bad, gnarly things happen. We gotta roll with the punches. Ha. So things do happen at these events, all type of things. So let's play this, the game of guess which conference this happened at. <laughs> Crappy crashed Wi-Fi. Every conference. Everyone. Yeah. Every, except for yes. Seattle JS. Awesome Wi-Fi. <laughs> Protesters, police with tear gas. Yes. <laughs> It really did happen. Food poisoning. Yeah. Hurricanes. <laughs> intense, unseasonable heat during an outdoor event. Power outage. Ugh. And last minute speaker cancellations. Every conference ever. Yep, everyone, every event ever. So anything can happen. Building the team is the single most important thing that you will do. We strongly advise for your conference that you have a minimum support of three organizers, which we require of our own conferences. We have found it useful to break down the roles. A diverse team of individuals, demographic, backgrounds, industry, age, et cetera, who are excited, who are excited to tackle this role is beneficial to the conference outcome and experience. So first we'll look at the producers. Uh, we believe that in order to maximize the success of an event, that someone has to be in charge. So these people are ultimately accountable for everything that happens. These are often the same people who are financially on the hook for the event. Uh, responsible for overseeing organizers, intersections of multiple people's work, and overall project management. Producers agree to the code of conduct, uh, have likely written it themselves, and execute on any reports of violation. What we're currently viewing as producer roles 
um, and that we tend to share are uh, accounting and speaker, uh, sponsor experience. So it's budget, reimbursements, payments, invoices, uh, and also logistics uh, along with venue coordination. So vendors, hotel, and transportation. Now, anything that requires financial access and signing ability. The time commitment is roughly five hours per week when the conference is at least four months away um, and ramps up to 10 hours per week leading up to the conference. And uh, when I wrote that, I realized that that is an extremely conservative estimate. Uh, the week before the conference is very much guaranteed to be a full-time job. Then we have the organizers. We've broken up the roles of organizers based off of vital tasks that have come up over the years. Work is managed by producers, but an organizer could potentially manage others, such as volunteers. Much like the producers, organizers agree to the code of conduct and execute any report of violation with a guidance of a producer. And such roles for organizers include marketing, copy, social media, anything that influences ticket sales. Speaker experience, so the CFP, the acceptance, the client emails, the website, anything, just content and program curating, workshop curators, artists, designers, branding, especially, yeah, artists, designers, and brandings are very important. And then time commitment for organizers can vary by responsibility, but 50% of the time commitment of the producer is a good estimate. Side note, we all know how hard it is to recruit good talent. Trying to get good talent as organizers for free, a lot harder. So what to look for when recruiting an organizer or producer? Uh, how do you find Catherine's and Tracy's? Uh, so this has been a question uh, that we get asked pretty regularly. Uh, and I think the short answer is uh, you, you know these people. Um, they're proactive, they're energetic, they prioritize goodwill, they're ridiculously organized, and most importantly, they show up. So they'll be there and they'll stay long after everyone else is gone. Uh, a little bit masochistic as well. Uh, so uh, some familiarity with their work, if you're ever wanting to do something like pass on a conference to them, uh, is really important uh, because then you'll want to have a long chat. It's essentially an interview that turns into some level of trust and confidence. And then you'll have the proving ground, which is them actually doing something with that. You have to make sure your values align um, or you'll be frustrated down the road. And we'll visit this more in the heartfelt experiences um, portion, but you're trusting someone else with your business. And on the other side of that, how do you become a producer or an organizer? That leads us back to volunteers. So volunteers make up the lifeblood of the live event. These folks assist during the conference itself, including the setup and teardown. Volunteers should expect to work the duration of the conference of the conference plus one day on either end for setup or teardown. Volunteering is important. It can be valuable for networking, for your work. It can help establish skills and trust to become a producer or organizer down the road. Since volunteers step up to the game on the day of, they are usually not aware of the logistics. The team is responsible for coordinating volunteers and sharing the playbook for the day of. All volunteers and organizers should be walked through the code of conduct together with the producers, as they will be supporting players in keeping the conference experience safe and friendly. So make it clear that the biggest responsibility every team member has is to communicate. You have to help teach folks how to take care of themselves. Uh, when they can't tackle something, all someone should be able to do it further is to wave their hands and someone else or multiple people on the team should be able to immediately pick it up. Supporting one another and making sure people are empathetic to themselves uh, will help you all survive the planning season. But what if it's still all too much? Burnout. It, it, it happens. It, we don't get the support we need the time in the time we need it. We don't communicate when we need something and we don't practice proper self-care. What does it look like? not caring about things you normally really love, not being able to force yourself to get the task on your conference to-do list started, yet alone finished, feeling bitter endlessly towards your community and organizing team despite them being a good force, avoidance, feeling the burden of obligation to the community. 
So when to step away? Uh, when you notice this about yourself, or when a friend is real enough to call you out about it? Uh, and how long do you step away? And this depends. Uh, some conferences sunset, others take a break. Some still recruit new organizers to take on the charge. Do organizers owe it to a community to see a conf continue? Uh, this has caused holes in community experience over many programming languages over the years. But we're also talking about humans that should not be beholden to a cause forever. Much like those open source projects so near and dear to your hearts. Uh, so then what is the burden to pass it on, uh, that responsibility? You have to build it and transition it in a way that makes it possible to do that. And that's thorough documentation, that's business accounts separate from your own personal, uh, a culture of teaching and organizing. So many of the practices we've defined in GatherScript were designed to create this, a healthy, sustainable way to continue conferences when you no longer can. And they're all built off of years of experience. So you have to plan for burnout. Life happens, serious illnesses, loss, new families, new jobs. Build your interdisciplinary team from what we've recommended and make sure there's enough folks to help take over and trust them. Support each other when the world is doing otherwise. One of the most valuable things we do as a team is to laugh in all of these tough moments, to focus on the good and the chaos, from pitfalls to the true payoff. For us, it's all, it's a legacy of heartfelt experiences. So you can copy and paste an event. Uh, the difference in the experience is the level of care, just like your open source code work. It's iterating and never taking for granted how teachable you must stay as a responsible caretaker for those consuming your work. It's the little in-betweens. What works for one geography may not work for another. This is the fuel for which we seemingly endlessly run on. So first time, conference attendees, often new in the field or in crappy jobs, get to network and make friends through the gift of scholarships. They learn, build up their skills, commit to open source projects even, and then become first time speakers. This snowballs into being a known expert in a community stronghold. Because we focus on lifting up positivity in the space as well, and that includes in speakers, this pays back in droves when you have more helpful friendly, knowledgeable people in your community giving back. One of my favorite experiences in conference organizing is the story of Claudia and Mariko. Mariko's first conference speaking was at EmpireJS. She's an incredible force in the community in New York, now in code and in art, and co-organizes Brooklyn JS. Mariko bought a ticket to go to JSConf Colombia, and unfortunately couldn't attend, so she donated her ticket to the scholarship fund along with some money. I then transferred this ticket on to Claudia, and we paid for her hotel and flight since she was coming from a different city and at the time didn't have a job. She had a great experience. She was very proactive and happy to be there. Great. One year later, when we're selling early bird tickets, one of the few first people that buys a ticket is Claudia, the same attendee from last time. And I, hey, I told her, hey, I didn't, it's great that you're buying your ticket. And she said, yeah, I had such a great time that I'm coming back. And I got a job from Joyce Cove, Colombia. So I think I wanted to go back. And I saw that Mariko's headlining. And I said, great. At this point, Claudia did not know that Mariko had donated her ticket and money for her to go to Joyce Conf. Then the events came around. And then we were at the closing event. I completely had forgotten to connect them together. And while I was talking to Mariko, I said, oh, Mariko, Claudia's here, the one who got your ticket and your money. Do you want me to introduce? And she said, sure. And we got to talk to each other. They met. And it happens that one of the main reasons Claudia went back to Jay's comp again, besides her experience, was that she wanted to meet Mariko because she had been following in Mariko's career because she personally, Claudia personally has an interest in knitting, which is also Mariko's passion. And after that, they just hit it off and have become friends. And Claudia is also now speaking at local meetups in Colombia. So it's all coming together. And what's something that's really beautiful about this too is that um, Marco's first speaking at a conference ever was at Empire JS years ago. Yes. And she is a force when it comes to speaking now. Um, and she's currently a dev evangelist at Google. So we're really lucky that she also gives back to 
uh, the New York community as one of the organizers for Brooklyn JS. Uh, so it's such a cycle. Um, and uh, another part of that is the career building around this. So as organizers, you also get to try out new roles that you want to try and expand on for your own career. Um, but then there's whole co essentially cohorts of people that I know who attended conferences together, got jobs together at these conferences, and we've seen each other sort of get raised up through these experiences um, and have seen um, the acceleration of our own paths through attending and speaking uh, and making those networks and those genuine connections happen. So JSConf US inspired many of us to establish and maintain conferences. Cascadia established a JavaScript family in the Pacific Northwest. New York inspired a group, a series of meetups, the borough JSs, that has broken far out, uh, out of the boroughs. JSConf Colombia has also helped transform a region into a vital tech scene in South America. Uh, so we're building the community that we want to exist in the world. Values, openness, fairness, inclusiveness. Where we saw disparities, we've pushed forward to create small worlds of how we hope the larger space will eventually be. We're establishing a model and precedence for others to feel comfortable to follow, regardless of the pitfalls we might experience short term. It's a lot of work. It's clearly very hard. But once you see the inside, it's very much worth it. We're building, we're building upon a support network for those running events. Support the support to help one another thrive through the communities we're sustaining. A lot of the struggles that we see occur are unnecessary and can be avoided with help. However, many of the problems aren't solved. As community events, we, we're pushing the boundaries of what works to nurture, delight, curiosity, and camaraderie. Providing this platform helps provide a sustainable future for healthy communities. And that said, we have way too many people to thank, uh, from organizers to mentors to volunteers and informal advisors and friends who have been our support systems throughout the years. Uh, these are organizations and people who we can't list because we would have just had to make a scrolling GIF of all the people who are a part of this and help support our work. Uh, and uh, so we just want to say thanks. And anybody who wants to see the documentation um, of that open source handbook can check it out on GitHub. Thanks. Thank you.